section one of the book of american negro poetry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the book of american negro poetry edited by james weldon johnson preface part one there is perhaps a better excuse for giving an anthology of american negro poetry to the public than can be offered for many of the anthologies that have recently been issued the public generally speaking does not know that there are american negro poets to supply this lack of information is alone a work worthy of somebody's effort moreover the matter of negro poets and the production of literature by the colored people in this country involves more than supplying information that is lacking it is a matter which has a direct bearing on the most vital of american problems a people may become great through many means but there is only one measure by which its greatness is recognized and acknowledged the final measure of the greatness of all peoples is the amount and standard of the literature and art they have produced the world does not know that a people is great until that people produces great literature and art no people that has produced great literature and art has ever been looked upon by the world as distinctly inferior the status of the negro in the united states is more a question of national mental attitude toward the race than of actual conditions and nothing will do more to change that mental attitude and raise his status than a demonstration of intellectual parity by the negro through the production of literature and art is there a likelihood that the american negro will be able to do this there is for the good reason that he possesses the innate powers he has the emotional endowment the originality and artistic conception and what is more important the power of creating that which has universal appeal and influence i make here what may appear to be a more startling statement by saying that the negro has already proved the possession of these powers by being the creator of the only things artistic that have yet sprung up from american soil and been universally acknowledged as distinctive american products these creations by the american negro may be summed up under four heads the first two are the uncle remus stories which were collected by joel chandler harris and the spirituals or slave songs to which the fisk jubilee singers made the public and the musicians of both the united states and europe listen the uncle remus stories constitute the greatest body of folklore that america has produced and the spirituals the greatest body of folk song i shall speak of the spirituals later because they are more than folk songs for in them the negro sounded the depths if he did not scale the heights of music the other two creations are the cakewalk and ragtime we do not need to go very far back to remember when cakewalking was the rage in the united states europe and south america society in this country and royalty abroad spent time in practising the intricate steps paris pronounced it the poetry of motion the popularity of the cakewalk passed away but its influence remained the influence can be seen to-day on any american stage where there is dancing the influence which the negro has exercised on the art of dancing in this country has been almost absolute for generations the buck and wing and the stop-time dances which are strictly negro have been familiar to american theatre audiences a few years ago the public discovered the turkey trot the eagle rock ball in the jack and several other varieties that started the modern dance craze 
these dances were quickly followed by the tango a dance originated by the negroes of cuba and later transplanted to south america this fact is attested by no less authority than vincente blasco ibanez in his four horsemen of the apocalypse half the floor space in the country was then turned over to dancing and highly paid exponents sprang up everywhere the most noted mr vernon castle and by the way an englishman never danced except to the music of a colored band and he never failed to state to his audiences that most of his dances had long been done by your colored people as he put it any one who witnesses a musical production in which there is dancing cannot fail to notice the negro stamp on all the movements a stamp which even the great vogue of russian dances that swept the country about the time of the popular dance craze could not affect that peculiar swaying of the shoulders which you see done everywhere by the blonde girls of the chorus is nothing more than a movement from the negro dance referred to above the eagle rock occasionally the movement takes on a suggestion of the now outlawed shimmy as for ragtime i go straight to the statement that it is the one artistic production by which america is known the world over it has been all conquering everywhere it is hailed as american music for a dozen years or so there has been a steady tendency to divorce ragtime from the negro in fact to take from him the credit of having originated it probably the younger people of the present generation do not know that ragtime is of negro origin the change wrought in ragtime and the way in which it is accepted by the country have been brought about chiefly through the change which has gradually been made in the words and stories accompanying the music once the text of all ragtime songs was written in negro dialect and was about negroes in the cabin or in the cotton field or on the levee or at a jubilee or on sixth avenue or at a ball and about their love affairs to-day only a small proportion of ragtime songs relate at all to the negro the truth is ragtime is now national rather than racial but that does not abolish in any way the claim of the american negro as its originator ragtime music was originated by colored piano players in the questionable resorts of st louis memphis and other mississippi river towns these men did not know any more about the theory of music than they did about the theory of the universe they were guided by their natural musical instinct and talent but above all by the negro's extraordinary sense of rhythm any one who is familiar with ragtime may note that its chief charm is not in melody but in rhythms these players often improvised crude and at times vulgar words to fit the music this was the beginning of the ragtime song ragtime music got its first popular hearing at chicago during the world's fair in that city from chicago it made its way to new york and then started on its universal triumph the earliest ragtime songs like topsy jess grew some of these earliest songs were taken down by white men the words slightly altered or changed and published under the names of the arrangers they sprang into immediate popularity and earned small fortunes the first to become widely known was the bully a levee song which had been long used by roustabouts along the mississippi it was introduced in new york by miss may irwin and gained instant popularity another one of these jess grew songs was one which for a while disputed for place with yankee doodle perhaps disputes it even to-day that song was a hot time in the old town to-night introduced and made popular by the colored regimental bands during the spanish-american war later there came along a number of colored men 
who were able to transcribe the old songs and write original ones i was about that time writing words to music for the music show stage in new york i was collaborating with my brother j rosamond johnson and the late bob cole i remember that we appropriated about the last one of the old jess grew songs it was a song which had been sung for years all through the south the words were unprintable but the tune was irresistible and belonged to nobody we took it rewrote the verses telling an entirely different story from the original left the chorus as it was and published the song at first under the name of will handy it became very popular with college boys especially at football games and perhaps still is the song was oh didn't he ramble in the beginning and for quite a while almost all of the ragtime songs that were deliberately composed were the work of colored writers now the colored composers even in this particular field are greatly outnumbered by the white the reader might be curious to know if the just grew songs have ceased to grow no they have not they are growing all the time the country has lately been flooded with several varieties of the blues these blues too had their origin in memphis and the towns along the mississippi they are a sort of lament of a lover who is feeling blue over the loss of his sweetheart the blues of memphis have been adulterated so much on broadway that they have lost their pristine hue but whenever you hear a piece of music which has a strain like this in it you will know you are listening to something which belonged originally to beale avenue memphis tennessee the original memphis blues so far as it can be credited to a composer must be credited to mr w c handy a colored musician of memphis as illustrations of the genuine ragtime song in the making i quote the words of two that were popular with the southern colored soldiers in france here is the first ma mammy's lying in her grave ma daddy done run away ma sister's married a gamblin man and i've done gone astray yes i've done gone astray poor boy and i've done gone astray ma sister's married a gamblin man and i've done gone astray po boy these lines are crude but they contain something of real poetry of that elusive thing which nobody can define and that you can only tell that it is there when you feel it you cannot read these lines without becoming reflective and feeling sorry for po boy now take in this word picture of utter dejection i'm just as miserable as i can be i'm unhappy even if i am free i'm feelin down i'm feelin blue i wander round don't know what to do i'm goin to lay my haid on de railroad line let de b and o come and pacify my mind these lines are no doubt one of the many versions of the famous blues they are also crude but they go straight to the mark the last two lines move with the swiftness of all great tragedy in spite of the bands which musicians and music teachers have placed on it the people still demand and enjoy ragtime in fact there is not a corner of the civilized world in which it is not known and liked and this proves its originality for if it were an imitation the people of europe at least would not have found it a novelty and it is proof of a more important thing it is proof that ragtime possesses the vital spark the power to appeal universally without which any artistic production no matter how approved its form may be is dead of course there are those who will deny that ragtime is an artistic production american musicians especially instead of investigating ragtime dismiss it with a contemptuous word but this has been the course of scholasticism in every branch of art whatever new thing the people like is pooh-poohed whatever is popular is regarded as not worth while the fact is nothing great or enduring in music has ever sprung full-fledged from the brain of any master 
the best he gives the world he gathers from the hearts of the people and runs it through the alembic of his genius ragtime deserves serious attention there is a lot of colourless and vicious imitation but there is enough that is genuine in one composition alone the memphis blues the musician will find not only great melodic beauty but a polyphonic structure that is amazing it is obvious that ragtime has influenced and in a large measure become our popular music but not many would know that it has influenced even our religious music those who are familiar with gospel hymns can at once see this influence if they will compare the songs of thirty years ago such as in the sweet by and by the ninety and nine etc with the up-to-date syncopated tunes that are sung in sunday schools christian endeavor societies y m c a s and like gatherings to-day ragtime has not only influenced american music it has influenced american life indeed it has saturated american life it has become the popular medium for our national expression musically and who can say that it does not express the blare and jangle and the surge too of our national spirit any one who doubts that there is a peculiar heel tickling smile provoking joy awakening response compelling charm in ragtime needs only to hear a skilful performer play the genuine article needs only to listen to its bizarre harmonies its audacious resolutions often consisting of an abrupt jump from one key to another its intricate rhythms in which the accents fall in the most unexpected places but in which the fundamental beat is never lost in order to be convinced i believe it has its place as well as the music which draws from us sighs and tears now these dances which i have referred to and ragtime music may be lower forms of art but they are evidence of a power that will some day be applied to the higher forms and even now we need not stop at the negro's accomplishment through these lower forms in the spirituals or slave songs the negro has given america not only its only folk songs but a mass of noble music i never think of this music but that i am struck by the wonder the miracle of its production how did the men who originated these songs manage to do it the sentiments are easily accounted for they are for the most part taken from the bible but the melodies where did they come from some of them so weirdly sweet and others so wonderfully strong take for instance go down moses i doubt that there is a stronger theme in the whole musical literature of the world it is to be noted that whereas the chief characteristic of ragtime is rhythm the chief characteristic of the spirituals is melody the melodies of steal away to jesus swing low sweet chariot nobody knows de trouble i see i couldn't hear nobody pray deep river o oh, freedom over me and many others of these songs possess a beauty that is what shall i say poignant in the riotous rhythms of ragtime the negro expressed his irrepressible buoyancy his keen response to the sheer joy of living in the spirituals he voiced his sense of beauty and his deep religious feeling naturally not as much can be said for the words of these songs as for the music most of the songs are religious some of them are songs expressing faith and endurance and a longing for freedom in the religious songs the sentiments and often the entire lines are taken bodily from the bible however there is no doubt that some of these religious songs have a meaning apart from the biblical text it is evident that the opening lines of go down moses go down moses way down in egypt land tell old pharaoh let my people go have a significance beyond the bondage of israel and egypt the bulk of the lines to these songs as is the case in all communal music is made up of choral iteration and incremental repetition of the leader's lines if the words are read this constant iteration and repetition are found to be tiresome 
and it must be admitted that the lines themselves are often very trite and yet there is frequently revealed a flash of real primitive poetry i give the following examples sometimes i feel like an eagle in de air you may bury me in de east you may bury me in de west but i'll hear de trumpet sound in a dat mornin i know de moonlight i know de starlight i lay dis body down i walk in de moonlight i walk in de starlight i lay dis body down i know de graveyard i know de graveyard when i lay dis body down i walk in de graveyard i walk true de graveyard to lay dis body down i lay in de grave and stretch out my arms i lay dis body down i go to de judgment in de evening of de day when i lay dis body down and my soul and yo soul will meet in de day when i lay dis body down regarding the line i lay in de grave and stretch out my arms colonel thomas wentworth higginson of boston one of the first to give these slave songs serious study said never it seems to me since man first lived and suffered was his infinite longing for peace uttered more plaintively than in that line these negro folk songs constitute a vast mine of material that has been neglected almost absolutely the only white writers who have in recent years given adequate attention and study to this music that i know of are mr h e cribbeel and mrs natalie curtis burlin we have our native composers denying the worth and importance of this music in trying to manufacture grand opera out of so-called indian themes but there is a great hope for the development of this music and that hope is the negro himself a worthy beginning has already been made by burley cook johnson and Dett, and there will yet come great negro composers who will take this music and voice through it not only the soul of their race but the soul of america and does it not seem odd that this greatest gift of the negro has been the most neglected of all he possesses money and effort have been expended upon his development in every direction except this this gift has been regarded as a kind of side show something for occasional exhibition wherein it is the touchstone it is the magic thing it is that by which the negro can bridge all chasms no persons however hostile can listen to negroes singing this wonderful music without having their hostility melted down this power of the negro to suck up the national spirit from the soil and create something artistic and original which at the same time possesses the note of universal appeal is due to a remarkable racial gift of adaptability it is more than adaptability it is a transfusive quality and the negro has exercised this transfusive quality not only here in america where the race lives in large numbers but in european countries where the number has been almost infinitesimal is it not curious to know that the greatest poet of russia is alexander pushkin a man of african descent that the greatest romancer of france is alexander dumas a man of african descent and that one of the greatest musicians of england is coleridge taylor a man of african descent the fact is fairly well known that the father of dumas was a negro of the french west indies and that the father of coleridge taylor was a native-born african but the facts concerning pushkin's african ancestry are not so familiar when peter the great was czar of russia some potentate presented him with a full-blooded negro of gigantic size peter the most eccentric ruler of modern times dressed this negro up in soldier clothes christened him hannibal and made him a special bodyguard but hannibal had more than size he had brain and ability he not only looked picturesque and imposing in soldier clothes he showed that he had in him the making of a real soldier peter recognized this and eventually made him a general 
he afterwards ennobled him and hannibal later married one of the ladies of the russian court this same hannibal was great-grandfather of pushkin the national poet of russia the man who bears the same relation to russian literature that shakespeare bears to english literature i know the question naturally arises if out of the few negroes who have lived in france there came a dumas and out of the few negroes who have lived in england there came a coleridge taylor and if from the man who was at the time probably the only negro in russia there sprang that country's national poet why have not the millions of negroes in the united states with all the emotional and artistic endowment claimed for them produced a dumas or a coleridge taylor or a pushkin the question seems difficult but there is an answer the negro in the united states is consuming all of his intellectual energy in this gruelling race struggle and the same statement may be made in a general way about the white south why does not the white south produce literature and art the white south too is consuming all of its intellectual energy in this lamentable conflict nearly all of the mental efforts of the white south run through one narrow channel the life of every southern white man and all of his activities are impassably limited by the ever-present negro problem and that is why as mr h l mencken puts it in all that vast region with its thirty or forty million people and its territory as large as a half a dozen frances or germanys there is not a single poet not a serious historian not a creditable composer not a critic good or bad not a dramatist dead or alive but even so the american negro has accomplished something in pure literature the list of those who have done so would be surprising both by its length and the excellence of the achievements one of the great books written in this country since the civil war is the work of a colored man the souls of black folk by w e b du bois such a list begins with phyllis wheatley in seventeen sixty one a slave ship landed a cargo of slaves in boston among them was a little girl seven or eight years of age she attracted the attention of john wheatley a wealthy gentleman of boston who purchased her as a servant for his wife mrs wheatley was a benevolent woman she noticed the girl's quick mind and determined to give her opportunity for its development twelve years later phyllis published a volume of poems the book was brought out in london where phyllis was for several months an object of great curiosity and attention phyllis wheatley has never been given her rightful place in american literature by some sort of conspiracy she is kept out of most of the books especially the textbooks on literature used in the schools of course she is not a great american poet and in her day there were no great american poets but she is an important american poet her importance if for no other reason rests on the fact that save one she is the first in order of time of all the women poets of america and she is among the first of all american poets to issue a volume it seems strange that the books generally give space to a mention of urian oakes president of harvard college and to quotations from the crude and lengthy elegy which he published in sixteen sixty seven and print examples from the execrable versified version of the psalms made by the new england divines and yet deny a place to phyllis wheatley here are the opening lines from the elegy by oakes which is quoted from in most of the books on american literature reader i am no poet but i grieve behold here what that passion can do that forced a verse without apollo's leave and whether the learned sisters would or no there was no need for urian to admit what his handiwork declared but this from the versified psalms is still worse yet it is found in the books the lord's song sing can we being in strangers land then let loose her skill my right hand if i jerusalem forget anne bradstreet preceded phyllis wheatley by a little over twenty years 
she published her volume of poems the tenth muse in seventeen fifty let us strike a comparison between the two anne bradstreet was a wealthy cultivated puritan girl the daughter of thomas dudley governor of bay colony phyllis as we know was a negro slave girl born in africa let us take them both at their best and in the same vein the following stanza is from anne's poem entitled contemplation while musing thus with contemplation fed and thousand fancies buzzing in my brain the sweet-tongued philomel perched o'er my head and chanted forth a most melodious strain which wrapped me so with wonder and delight i judged my hearing better than my sight and wished me wings with her a while to take my flight and the following is from phyllis poem entitled imagination imagination who can sing thy force or who describe the swiftness of thy course soaring through air to find the bright abode the imperial palace of the thundering god we on thy pinions can surpass the wind and leave the rolling universe behind from star to star the mental optics rove measure the skies and range the realms above there in one view we grasp the mighty whole or with new worlds amaze the unbounded soul we do not think the black woman suffers much by comparison with the white thomas jefferson said of phyllis religion has produced a phyllis wheatley but it could not produce a poet her poems are beneath contempt it is quite likely that jefferson's criticism was directed more against religion than against phyllis poetry on the other hand general george washington wrote her with his own hand a letter in which he thanked her for a poem which she had dedicated to him he later received her with marked courtesy at his camp at cambridge it appears certain that phyllis was the first person to apply to george washington the phrase first in peace the phrase occurs in her poem addressed to his excellency general george washington written in seventeen seventy five the encomium first in war first in peace first in the hearts of his countrymen was originally used in the resolutions presented to congress on the death of washington december seventeen ninety nine phyllis wheatley's poetry is the poetry of the eighteenth century she wrote when pope and gray were supreme it is easy to see that pope was her model had she come under the influence of wordsworth byron or keats or shelley she would have done greater work as it is her work must not be judged by the work and standards of a later day but by the work and standards of her own day and her own contemporaries by this method of criticism she stands out as one of the important characters in the making of american literature without any allowances for her sex or her antecedents according to a bibliographical checklist of american negro poetry compiled by mr arthur a schomburg more than one hundred negroes in the united states have published volumes of poetry ranging in size from pamphlets to books of from one hundred to three hundred pages about thirty of these writers fill in the gap between phyllis wheatley and paul lawrence dunbar just here it is of interest to note that a negro wrote and published a poem before phyllis wheatley arrived in this country from africa he was jupiter hammond a slave belonging to a mr lloyd of queen's village long island in seventeen sixty hammond published a poem eighty-eight lines in length entitled an evening thought salvation by christ with penitential cries in seventeen eighty eight he published an address to miss phyllis wheatley ethiopian poetess in boston who came from africa at eight years of age and soon became acquainted with the gospel of jesus christ these two poems do not include all that hammond wrote the poets between phyllis wheatley and dunbar must be considered more in the light of what they attempted than of what they accomplished many of them showed marked talent but barely a half dozen of them demonstrated even mediocre mastery of technique and the use of poetic material and forms and yet there are several names that deserve mention george m horton francis e harper 
james m bell and albury a whitman all merit consideration when due allowances are made for their limitations in education training and general culture the limitations of horton were greater than those of either of the others he was born a slave in north carolina in seventeen ninety seven and as a young man began to compose poetry without being able to write it down later he received some instruction from professors of the university of north carolina at which institution he was employed as a janitor he published a volume of poems the hope of liberty in eighteen twenty nine mrs harper bell and whitman would stand out if only for the reason that each of them attempted sustained work mrs harper published her first volume of poems in eighteen fifty four but later she published moses a story of the nile a poem which ran to fifty-two closely printed pages bell in eighteen sixty four published a poem of twenty-eight pages in celebration of president lincoln's emancipation proclamation in eighteen seventy he published a poem of thirty-two pages in celebration of the ratification of the fifteenth amendment to the constitution whitman published his first volume of poems a book of two hundred and fifty three pages in eighteen seventy seven but in eighteen eighty four he published the rape of florida an epic poem written in four cantos and done in the spenserian stanza and which ran to ninety seven closely printed pages the poetry of both mrs harper and of whitman had a large degree of popularity one of mrs harper's books went through more than twenty editions of these four poets it is whitman who reveals not only the greatest imagination but also the more skilful workmanship his lyric power at its best may be judged from the following stanza from the rape of florida come now my love the moon is on the lake upon the waters is my light canoe come with me love and gladsome oars shall make a music on the parting wave for you come o'er the waters deep and dark and blue come where the lilies in the marge have sprung come with me love for oh my love is true this is the song that on the lake was sung the boatman sang it when his heart was young some idea of whitman's capacity for dramatic narration may be gained from the following lines taken from not a man and yet a man a poem of even greater length than the rape of florida a flash of steely lightning from his hand strikes down the groaning leader of the band divides his startled comrades and again descending leaves fair dora's captors slain her seizing them within a strong embrace out in the dark he wheels his flying pace he speaks not but with stalwart tenderness her swelling bosom firm to his doth press springs like a stag that flees the eager hound and like a whirlwind rustles o'er the ground her locks swim in dishevelled wildness o'er his shoulders streaming to his waist and more while on and on strong as a rolling flood his sweeping footsteps part the silent wood it is curious and interesting to trace the growth of individuality and race consciousness in this group of poets jupiter hammond's verses were almost entirely religious exhortations only very seldom does phyllis wheatley sound a native note four times in single lines she refers to herself as afric's muse in a poem of admonition addressed to the students at the university of cambridge in new england she refers to herself as follows ye blooming plants of human race divine an ethiop tells you tis your greatest foe but one looks in vain for some outburst or even complaint against the bondage of her people for some agonizing cry about her native land in two poems she refers definitely to africa as her home but in each instance there seems to be under the sentiment of the lines a feeling of almost smug contentment at her own escape therefrom in the poem on being brought from africa to america she says twas mercy brought me from my pagan land taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a god and there's a saviour too once i redemption neither sought or knew some view our sable race with scornful eye their colour is a diabolic dye remember christians negroes black as cane may be refined and joined angelic train 
in the poem addressed to the earl of dartmouth she speaks of freedom and makes a reference to the parents from whom she was taken as a child a reference which cannot but strike the reader as rather unimpassioned should you my lord while you peruse my song wonder from whence my love of freedom sprung whence flow these wishes for the common good by feeling hearts alone best understood i young in life by seeming cruel fate was snatched from afric's fancied happy seat what pangs excruciating must molest what sorrows labour in my parents breast steeled was that soul and by no misery moved that from a father seized his babe beloved such such my case and can i then but pray others may never feel tyrannic sway the bulk of phyllis wheatley's work consists of poems addressed to people of prominence her book was dedicated to the countess of huntington at whose house she spent the greater part of her time while in england on his repeal of the stamp act she wrote a poem to king george the third whom she saw later another poem she wrote to the earl of dartmouth whom she knew a number of her verses were addressed to other persons of distinction indeed it is apparent that phyllis was far from being a democrat she was far from being a democrat not only in her social ideas but also in her political ideas unless a religious meaning is given to the closing lines of her ode to general washington she was a decided royalist a crown a mansion and a throne that shine with gold and fading washington be thine nevertheless she was an ardent patriot her ode to general washington seventeen seventy five her spirited poem on major general lee seventeen seventy six and her poem liberty and peace written in celebration of the close of the war reveal not only strong patriotic feeling but an understanding of the issues at stake in her poem on major general lee she makes her hero reply thus to the taunts of the british commander into whose hands he has been delivered through treachery o oh, arrogance of tongue and wild ambition ever prone to wrong believest thou chief that armies such as thine can stretch in dust that heaven defended lie in vain allies may swarm from distant lands and demons aid in formidable bands great as thou art thou shunst the field of fame disgrace to britain and the british name when offered combat by the noble foe foe to misrule why did the sword forego the easy conquest of the rebel land perhaps too easy for thy martial hand what various causes to the field invite for plunder you and we for freedom fight her cause divine with generous ardor fires and every bosom glows as she inspires already thousands of your troops have fled to the drear mansions of the silent dead columbia too beholds with streaming eyes her heroes fall tis freedom's sacrifice so wills the power who with convulsive storms shakes impious realms and nature's face deforms yet those brave troops and numerous as the sands one soul inspires one general chief commands find in your train of boasted heroes one to match the praise of godlike washington thrice happy chief in whom the virtues join and heaven taught prudence speaks the man divine what phyllis wheatley failed to achieve is due in no small degree to her education and environment her mind was steeped in the classics her verses are filled with classical and mythological allusions she knew ovid thoroughly and was familiar with other latin authors she must have known alexander pope by heart and too she was reared and sheltered in a wealthy and cultured family a wealthy and cultured boston family she never had the opportunity to learn life she never found out her own true relation to life and to her surroundings and it should not be forgotten that she was only about thirty years old when she died the impulsion or the compulsion that might have driven her genius off the worn paths out on a journey of exploration phyllis wheatley never received but whatever her limitations she merits more than america has accorded her horton who was born three years after phyllis wheatley's death expressed in all of his poetry strong complaint at his condition of slavery and a deep longing for freedom the following verses are typical of his style and his ability alas and am i born for this to wear this slavish chain deprived of all created bliss through hardship toil and pain 
come liberty thou cheerful sound roll through my ravished ears come let my grief in joys be drowned and drive away my fears in mrs harper we find something more than the complaint and the longing of horton we find an expression of a sense of wrong and injustice the following stanzas are from a poem addressed to the white women of america you can sigh o'er the sad-eyed armenian who weeps in her desolate home you can mourn o'er the exile of russia from kindred and friends doomed to roam but hark from our southland are floating sobs of anguish murmurs of pain and women heart-stricken are weeping o'er their tortured and slain have ye not o oh my favourite sisters just a plea a prayer or a tear for mothers who dwell neath the shadows of agony hatred and fear weep not o oh my well-sheltered sisters weep not for the negro alone but weep for your sons who must gather the crops which their fathers have sown whitman in the midst of the rape of florida a poem in which he related the taking of the state of florida from the seminoles stops and discusses the race question he discusses it in many other poems and he discusses it from many different angles in whitman we find not only an expression of a sense of wrong and injustice but we hear a note of faith and a note also of defiance for example in the opening to canto two of the rape of florida greatness by nature cannot be entailed it is an office ending with the man sage hero saviour though the sire be hailed the sun may reach obscurity in the van sublime achievements no no patent plan man's immortality is a book with seals and none but god shall open none else can but open it the mystery reveals manhood's conquest of man to heaven's respect appeals is manhood less because man's face is black let thunders of the loosened seals reply who shall the rider's restive steed turn back or who withstand the arrows he lets fly between the mountains of eternity genius ride forth thou gift and torch of heaven the mastery is kindled in thine eye to conquest ride thy bow of strength is given the trampled hordes if cast before thee shall be driven tis hard to judge if hatred of one's race by those who deem themselves superior born be worse than that quiescence in disgrace which only merits and should only scorn oh let me see the negro night and morn pressing and fighting in for place and power all earth is place all time the auspicious hour while heaven leans forth to look or will he quail or cower ah i abhor his protest and complaint his pious looks and patience i despise he can't evade the test disguised as saint the manly voice of freedom bids him rise and shake himself before philistine eyes and like a lion roused no sooner than a foe dare come play all his energies and court the fray with fury if he can for hell itself respects a fearless manly man it may be said that none of these poets strike a deep native strain or sound a distinctively original note either in matter or form that is true but the same thing may be said of all the american poets down to the writers of the present generation with the exception of poe and walt whitman the thing in which these black poets are mostly excelled by their contemporaries is mere technique End of section one section two of the book of american negro poetry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the book of american negro poetry edited by james weldon johnson preface part two paul lawrence dunbar stands out as the first poet from the negro race in the united states to show a combined mastery over poetic material and poetic technique to reveal innate literary distinction in what he wrote and to maintain a high level of performance 
he was the first to rise to a height from which he could take a perspective view of his own race he was the first to see objectively its humour its superstitions its shortcomings the first to feel sympathetically its heart wounds its yearnings its aspirations and to voice them all in a purely literary form dunbar's fame rests chiefly on his poems in negro dialect this appraisal of him is no doubt fair for in these dialect poems he not only carried his art to the highest point of perfection but he made a contribution to american literature unlike what any one else had made a contribution which perhaps no one else could have made of course negro dialect poetry was written before dunbar wrote most of it by white writers but the fact stands out that dunbar was the first to use it as a medium for the true interpretation of negro character and psychology and yet dialect poetry does not constitute the whole or even the bulk of dunbar's work in addition to a large number of poems of a very high order done in literary english he was the author of four novels and several volumes of short stories indeed dunbar did not begin his career as a writer of dialect i may be pardoned for introducing here a bit of reminiscence my personal friendship with paul dunbar began before he had achieved recognition and continued to be close until his death when i first met him he had published a thin volume oak and ivy which was being sold chiefly through his own efforts oak and ivy showed no distinctive negro influence but rather the influence of james whitcomb riley at this time paul and i were together every day for several months he talked to me a great deal about his hopes and ambitions in these talks he revealed that he had reached a realization of the possibilities of poetry in the dialect together with the recognition of the fact that it offered the surest way by which he could get a hearing often he said to me i've got to write dialect poetry it's the only way i can get them to listen to me i was with dunbar at the beginning of what proved to be his last illness he said to me then i have not grown i am writing the same things i wrote ten years ago and am writing them no better his self-accusation was not fully true he had grown and he had gained a sure control of his art but he had not accomplished the greater things of which he was constantly dreaming the public had held him to the things for which it had accorded him recognition if dunbar had lived he would have achieved some of those dreams but even while he talked so dejectedly to me he seemed to feel that he was not to live he died when he was only thirty-three it has a bearing on this entire subject to note that dunbar was of unmixed negro blood so as the greatest figure in literature which the colored race in the united states has produced he stands as an example at once refuting and confounding those who wish to believe that whatever extraordinary ability the afro-american shows is due to an admixture of white blood as a man dunbar was kind and tender in conversation he was brilliant and polished his voice was his chief charm and was a great element in his success as a reader of his own works in his actions he was impulsive as a child sometimes even erratic indeed his intimate friends almost looked upon him as a spoiled boy he was always delicate in health temperamentally he belonged to that class of poets who taine says are vessels too weak to contain the spirit of poetry the poets whom poetry kills 
the byrons the burnses the de musses the poes to whom may he be compared this boy who scribbled his early verses while he ran an elevator whose youth was a battle against poverty and who in spite of almost insurmountable obstacles rose to success a comparison between him and burns is not unfitting the similarity between many phases of their lives is remarkable and their works are not incommensurable burns took the strong dialect of his people and made it classic dunbar took the humble speech of his people and in it wrought music mention of dunbar brings up for consideration the fact that although he is the most outstanding figure in literature among the afro-americans of the united states he does not stand alone among the afro-americans of the whole western world there are placido and manzano in cuba lear and durand in haiti machado de assi in brazil leon lavio in martinique and others still that might be mentioned who stand on a plane with or even above dunbar placido and machado de assi rank as great in the literatures of their respective countries without any qualifications whatever they are world figures in the literature of the latin languages machado de assi is somewhat handicapped in this respect by having as his tongue and medium the lesser-known portuguese but placido writing in the language of spain mexico cuba and of almost the whole of south america is universally known his works have been republished in the original in spain mexico and in most of the latin american countries several editions have been published in the united states translations of his works have been made into french and german placido is in some respects the greatest of all the cuban poets in sheer genius and the fire of inspiration he surpasses even the more finished heredia then too his birth his life and his death ideally contain the tragic elements that go into the making of a halo about a poet's head placido was born in habana in eighteen hundred and nine the first months of his life were passed in a foundling asylum indeed his real name gabriel de la concepcion valdez was in honor of its founder his father took him out of the asylum but shortly afterwards went to mexico and died there his early life was a struggle against poverty his youth and manhood was a struggle for cuban independence his death placed him in the list of cuban martyrs on the twenty seventh of june eighteen forty four he was lined up against a wall with ten others and shot by order of the spanish authorities on a charge of conspiracy in his short but eventful life he turned out work which bulks more than six hundred pages during the few hours preceding his execution he wrote three of his best-known poems among them his famous sonnet mother farewell placido's sonnet to his mother has been translated into every important language william cullen bryant did it in english but in spite of its wide popularity it is perhaps outside of cuba the least understood of all placido's poems it is curious to note how bryant's translation totally misses the intimate sense of the delicate subtlety of the poem the american poet makes it a tender and loving farewell of a son who is about to die to a heartbroken mother but that is not the kind of a farewell that placido intended to write or did write the key to the poem is in the first word and the first word is the spanish conjunction c if the central idea then of the sonnet is if the sad fate which now overwhelms me should bring a pang to your heart do not weep for i die a glorious death and sound the last note of my lyre to you 
bryant either failed to understand or ignored the opening word if because he was not familiar with the poet's history while placido's father was a negro his mother was a spanish white woman a dancer in one of the habana theatres at his birth she abandoned him to a foundling asylum and perhaps never saw him again although it is known that she outlived her son when the poet came down to his last hours he remembered that somewhere there lived a woman who was his mother that although she had heartlessly abandoned him that although he owed her no filial duty still she might perhaps on hearing of his sad end feel some pang of grief or sadness so he tells her in his last words that he dies happy and bids her not to weep this he does with nobility and dignity but absolutely without affection taking into account these facts and especially their humiliating and embittering effect upon a soul so sensitive as placido's this sonnet in spite of the obvious weakness of the sestet as compared with the octave is a remarkable piece of work in considering the afro-american poets of the latin languages i am impelled to think that as up to this time the colored poets of greater universality have come out of the latin american countries rather than out of the united states they will continue to do so for a good many years the reason for this i hinted at in the first part of this preface the colored poet in the united states labors within limitations which he cannot easily pass over he is always on the defensive or the offensive the pressure upon him to be propagandic is well nigh irresistible these conditions are suffocating to breadth and to real art in poetry in addition he labors under the handicap of finding culture not entirely colorless in the united states on the other hand the colored poet of latin america can voice the national spirit without any reservations and he will be rewarded without any reservations whether it be to place him among the great or declare him the greatest so i think it probable that the first world acknowledged afro-american poet will come out of latin america over against this probability of course is the great advantage possessed by the colored poet in the united states of writing in the world conquering english language this preface has gone far beyond what i had in mind when i started it was my intention to gather together the best verses i could find by negro poets and present them with a bare word of introduction it was not my plan to make this collection inclusive nor to make the book in any sense a book of criticism i planned to present only verses by contemporary writers but perhaps because this is the first collection of its kind i realized the absence of a starting point and was led to provide one and to fill in with historical data what i feel to be a gap it may be surprising to many to see how little of the poetry being written by negro poets to-day is being written in negro dialect the newer negro poets show a tendency to discard dialect much of the subject matter which went into the making of traditional dialect poetry possums watermelons etc they have discarded altogether at least as poetic material this tendency will no doubt be regretted by the majority of white readers and indeed it would be a distinct loss if the american negro poets threw away this quaint and musical folk speech as a medium of expression and yet after all these poets are working through a problem not realized by the reader and perhaps by many of these poets themselves not realized consciously they are trying to break away from not negro dialect itself but the limitations on negro dialect imposed by the fixing effects of long convention the negro in the united states has achieved or been placed in a certain artistic niche 
when he is thought of artistically it is as a happy-go-lucky singing shuffling banjo-picking being or as a more or less pathetic figure the picture of him is in a log cabin amid fields of cotton or along the levees negro dialect is naturally and by long association the exact instrument for voicing this phase of negro life and by that very exactness it is an instrument with but two full stops humour and pathos so even when he confines himself to purely racial themes the afro-american poet realizes that there are phases of negro life in the united states which cannot be treated in the dialect either adequately or artistically take for example the phases rising out of life in harlem that most wonderful negro city in the world i do not deny that a negro in a log cabin is more picturesque than a negro in a harlem flat but the negro in the harlem flat is here and he is but part of a group growing everywhere in the country a group whose ideals are becoming increasingly more vital than those of the traditionally artistic group even if its members are less picturesque what the colored poet in the united states needs to do is something like what singe did for the irish he needs to find a form that will express the racial spirit by symbols from within rather than by symbols from without such as the mere mutilation of english spelling and pronunciation he needs a form that is freer and larger than dialect but which will still hold the racial flavor a form expressing the imagery the idioms the peculiar turns of thought and the distinctive humor and pathos too of the negro but which will also be capable of voicing the deepest and highest emotions and aspirations and allow of the widest range of subjects and the widest scope of treatment negro dialect is at present a medium that is not capable of giving expression to the varied conditions of negro life in america and much less is it capable of giving the fullest interpretation of negro character and psychology this is no indictment against the dialect as dialect but against the mould of convention in which negro dialect in the united states has been set in time these conventions may become lost and the colored poet in the united states may sit down to write in dialect without feeling that his first line will put the general reader in a frame of mind which demands that the poem be humorous or pathetic in the meantime there is no reason why these poets should not continue to do the beautiful things that can be done and done best in the dialect in stating the need for afro-american poets in the united states to work out a new and distinctive form of expression i do not wish to be understood to hold any theory that they should limit themselves to negro poetry to racial themes the sooner they are able to write american poetry spontaneously the better nevertheless i believe that the richest contribution the negro poet can make to the american literature of the future will be the fusion into it of his own individual artistic gifts not many of the writers here included except dunbar are known at all to the general reading public and there is only one of these who has a widely recognized position in the american literary world he is william stanley braithwaite mr braithwaite is not only unique in this respect but he stands unique among all the afro-american writers the united states has yet produced he has gained his place taking as the standard and measure for his work the identical standard and measure applied to american writers and american literature he is asked for no allowances or rewards either directly or indirectly on account of his race mr braithwaite is the author of two volumes of verses lyrics of delicate and tenuous beauty in his more recent and uncollected poems he shows himself more and more decidedly the mystic 
but his place in american literature is due more to his work as a critic and anthologist than to his work as a poet there is still another role he has played that of friend of poetry and poets it is a recognized fact that in the work which preceded the present revival of poetry in the united states no one rendered more unremitting and valuable service than mr braithwaite and it can be said that no future study of american poetry of this age can be made without reference to braithwaite two authors included in the book are better known for their work in prose than in poetry w e b du bois whose well-known prose at its best is however impassioned and rhythmical and benjamin brawley who is the author among other works of one of the best handbooks on the english drama that has yet appeared in america but the group of the new negro poets whose work makes up the bulk of this anthology contains names destined to be known claude mckay although still quite a young man has already demonstrated his power breadth and skill as a poet mr mckay's breadth is as essential a part of his equipment as his power and skill he demonstrates mastery of the three when as a negro poet he pours out the bitterness and rebellion in his heart in those two sonnet tragedies if we must die and to the white fiends in a manner that strikes terror and when as a cosmic poet he creates the atmosphere and mood of poetic beauty in the absolute as he does in spring in new hampshire and the harlem dancer mr mckay gives evidence that he has passed beyond the danger which threatens many of the new negro poets the danger of allowing the purely polemical phases of the race problem to choke their sense of artistry mr mckay's earliest work is unknown in this country it consists of poems written and published in his native jamaica i was fortunate enough to run across this first volume and i could not refrain from reproducing here one of the poems written in the west indian negro dialect i have done this not only to illustrate the widest range of the poet's talent and to offer a comparison between the american and the west indian dialects but on account of the intrinsic worth of the poem itself i was much tempted to introduce several more in spite of the fact that they might require a glossary because however greater work mr mckay may do he can never do anything more touching and charming than these poems in the jamaica dialect fenton johnson is a young poet of the ultra modern school who gives promise of greater work than he has yet done jessie fawcett shows that she possesses the lyric gift and she works with care and finish miss fawcett is especially adept in her translations from the french georgia douglas johnson is a poet neither afraid nor ashamed of her emotions she limits herself to the purely conventional forms rhythms and rhymes but through them she achieves striking effects the principal theme of mrs johnson's poems is the secret dread down in every woman's heart the dread of the passing of youth and beauty and with them love an old theme one which poets themselves have often wearied of but which like death remains one of the imperishable themes on which is made the poetry that has moved men's hearts through all ages in her ingenuously wrought verses through sheer simplicity and spontaneousness mrs johnson often sounds a note of pathos or passion that will not fail to waken a response except in those too sophisticated or cynical to respond to natural impulses of the half-dozen or so of colored women writing creditable verse and spencer is the most modern and least obvious in her methods her lines are at times involved and turgid and almost cryptic but she shows an originality which does not depend upon eccentricities in her before the feast of shushan she displays an opulence the love of which 
has long been charged against the negro as one of his naive and childish traits but which in art may infuse a much-needed colour warmth and spirit of abandon into american poetry john w holloway more than any negro poet writing in the dialect to-day summons to his work the lilt the spontaneity and charm of which dunbar was the supreme master whenever he employed that medium it is well to say a word here about the dialect poems of james edwin campbell in dialect campbell was a precursor of dunbar a comparison of his idioms and phonetics with those of dunbar reveals great differences dunbar is a shade or two more sophisticated and his phonetics approach nearer to a mean standard of the dialect spoken in the different sections campbell is more primitive and his phonetics are those of the dialect as spoken by the negroes of the sea islands off the coasts of south carolina and georgia which to this day remains comparatively close to its african roots and is strikingly similar to the speech of the uneducated negroes of the west indies an error that confuses many persons in reading or understanding negro dialect is the idea that it is uniform an ignorant negro of the uplands of georgia would have almost as much difficulty in understanding an ignorant sea island negro as an englishman would have not even in the dialect of any particular section is a given word always pronounced in precisely the same way its pronunciation depends upon the preceding and following sounds sometimes the combination permits of a liaison so close that to the uninitiated the sound of the word is almost completely lost the constant effort in negro dialect is to elide all troublesome consonants and sounds this negative effort may be after all only positive laziness of the vocal organs but the result is a softening and smoothing which makes negro dialect so delightfully easy for singers daniel webster davis wrote dialect poetry at the time when dunbar was writing he gained great popularity but it did not spread beyond his own race davis had unctuous humour but he was crude for illustration note the vast stretch between his hog meat and dunbar's when de cone pones hot both of them poems on the traditional ecstasy of the negro in contemplation of good things to eat it is regrettable that two of the most gifted writers included were cut off so early in life r c jameson and joseph s cotter jr died several years ago both of them in their youth jameson was barely thirty at the time of his death but among his poems there is one at least which stamps him as a poet of superior talent and lofty inspiration the negro soldiers is a poem with the race problem as its theme yet it transcends the limits of race and rises to a spiritual height that makes it one of the noblest poems of the great war cotter died a mere boy of twenty and the latter part of that brief period he passed in an invalid state some months before his death he published a thin volume of verses which were for the most part written on a sick-bed in this little volume cotter showed fine poetic sense and a free and bold mastery over his material a reading of cotter's poems is certain to induce that mood in which one will regretfully speculate on what the young poet might have accomplished had he not been cut off so soon as intimated above my original idea for this book underwent a change in the writing of the introduction i first planned to select twenty-five to thirty poems which i judged to be up to a certain standard and offer them with a few words of introduction and without comment in the collection as it grew to be that certain standard had been broadened if not lowered but i believe that this is offset by the advantage of the wider range given the reader and the student of the subject i offer this collection without making apology or asking allowance i feel confident that the reader will find not only an earnest for the future but actual achievement the reader cannot but be impressed by the distance already covered it is a long way from the plaints of george horton to the invectives of claude mckay from the obviousness of francis harper to the complexness of ann spencer much ground has been covered but more will yet be covered 
it is this side of prophecy to declare that the undeniable creative genius of the negro is destined to make a distinctive and valuable contribution to american poetry i wish to extend my thanks to mr arthur a schomburg who placed his valuable collection of books by negro authors at my disposal i wish also to acknowledge with thanks the kindness of dodd mead and company for permitting the reprint of poems by paul lawrence dunbar of the cornhill publishing company for permission to reprint poems of georgia douglas johnson joseph s cotter jr bertram johnson and waverley carmichael and of neal and company for permission to reprint poems of john w holloway i wish to thank mr braithwaite for permission to use the included poems from his forthcoming volume sandy star and willie g and to acknowledge the courtesy of the following magazines the crisis the century magazine the liberator the free man the independent others and poetry a magazine of verse james weldon johnson new york city nineteen twenty one end of section two section three of the book of american negro poetry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the book of american negro poetry edited by james weldon johnson section three paul lawrence dunbar a negro love song one seen my lady home last night jump back honey jump back hell ha hen and squeeze it tight jump back honey jump back head ha sigh a little sigh seen a light gleam from her eye and a smile go flittin by jump back honey jump back heard de wind blow through de pine jump back honey jump back mockin bird was singin fine jump back honey jump back and my heart was beatin so when i reached my lady's door dat i couldn't but to go jump back honey jump back put my arm around her waist jump back honey jump back raised her lips and took a taste jump back honey jump back love me honey love me true love me well as i love you and she answered cuz i do jump back honey jump back footnote one copyright by dodd mead and company and footnote little brown baby little brown baby with sparklin eyes come to ya poppy and set on his knee what ya be doin sure makin sand pies look at dat bib you's duty is me look at dat mouth dat's mer lasses i bet come here maria and wipe off his hands bis gwine to catch you and eat you up it been so sticky and sweet goodness lands little brown baby with sparklin eyes who's pappy darlin and who's pappy chill who is it all de day never once tries for to be cross er once loses dat smile what did ye get dem teeth my yours a scamp what did dat dimple come from in yer chin poppy don't know you i believes you a tramp mommy dis hears some old straggler got in let's throw em outen de dew in the sand 
we do want stragglers a lyin round here let's gin him way to de big bug man i know he's hidin around here right now bugaman bugaman come in de do he is a bad boy you can have fun to eat mommy and poppy do want him no more swaller him down from his head to his feet da now i thought dat you'd hug me up close go back o oh bugger you shan't have dis boy he ain't no tramp ner no struggler o oh course he's poppy's partner and playmate o joy come to you pallet now go to ye rest wish you could always know is an clear skies wish you could stay just a chill on my breast little brown baby with a sparklin eyes ships that pass in the night out in the sky the great dark clouds are massing i look far out into the pregnant night where i can hear a solemn booming gun and catch the gleaming of a random light that tells me that the ship i seek is passing passing my tearful eyes my soul's deep hurt are glassing for i would hail and check that ship of ships i stretch my hands imploring cry out loud my voice falls dead a foot from mine own lips and but its ghost doth reach that vessel passing passing o earth o sky o ocean both surpassing o heart of mine o soul that dreads the dark is there no hope for me is there no way that i may sight and check that speeding bark which out of sight and sound is passing passing lover's lane summer night and sighing breeze long de lover's lane friendly shadder making trees long de lover's lane white folks walk all done up grand me and matty han and han strutting that we own de lin long de lover's lane all a setting side de road long de lover's lane looking at us lack he nude dis us lover's lane go on hoot ye mournful tune you ain't never loved in june and come hidin from de moon down in lover's lane bush it bin and nod as way down in lover's lane trying to hear ye me what i say long de lover's lane but i whisper low like dis and my mandy smile her bliss mr bush he shack his fist down in lover's lane what i care of days long down in lover's lane i can always sing a song long de lover's lane and de words i hear a and say meeks up full de weary day when i strollin by de way down in lover's lane and dis aught will always rise down in lover's lane wonder with a uh, in disguise day's a lovely lane ef de ain't i'll tell you true leg on do look mighty blue cause i dunno what i do doubt a lover's lane the debt this is the debt i pay just for one riotous day years of regret and grief 
sorrow without relief pay it i will to the end until the grave my friend gives me a true release gives me the clasp of peace slight was the thing i brought small was the debt i thought poor was the loan at best god but the interest the haunted oak pray why are you so bare so bare o bough of the old oak tree and why when i go through the shade you throw runs a shudder over me my leaves were green as the best i trow and sap ran free in my veins but i saw in the moonlight dim and weird a guiltless victim's pains i bent me down to hear his sigh i shook with his gurgling moan and i trembled sore when they rode away and left him here alone they charged him with the old old crime and set him fast in jail oh why does the dog howl all night long and why does the night wind wail he prayed his prayer and he swore his oath and he raised his hand to the sky but the beat of hooves smote on his ear and the steady tread drew nigh who is it rides by day by night over the moonlit road and what is the spur that keeps the pace what is the galling goad and now they beat at the prison door ho keeper do not stay we are friends of him whom you hold within and we fain would take him away from those who ride fast on our heels with mine to do him wrong they have no care for his innocence and the rope they bear is long they have fooled the jailer with lying words they have fooled the man with lies the bolts unbar the locks are drawn and the great door open flies now they have taken him from the jail and hard and fast they ride and the leader laughs low down in his throat as they halt my trunk beside oh the judge he wore a mask of black and the doctor one of white and the minister with his oldest son with curiosity bedight o oh, foolish man why weep you now tis but a little space and the time will come when these shall dread the memory of your face i feel the rope against my bark and the weight of him in my grain i feel in the throe of his final woe the touch of my own last pain and never more shall leaves come forth on a bough that bears the ban i am burned with dread i am dried and dead from the curse of a guiltless man and ever the judge rides by rides by and goes to hunt the deer and ever another rides his soul in the guise of a mortal fear and ever the man he rides me hard and never a night stays he for i feel his curse as a haunted bough on the trunk of a haunted tree when the con ponds hot day is times in life when nature seems to slip a cog and go just a rattling down creation lack and oceans overflow when the world just stands a spinnin like a pickaninny's top and ye cup o oh joy is brimmin twill it seems about to stop and ye feel just lack a raka 
dat is training for to trot when ya mammy says de blessing and de cons pawns hot when you set down at de table kin o weary lack and said and you just a little tired and perhaps a little mad how you gloom turns into gladness how your joy drives out the doubt when the oven door is opened and the smell comes pawn out why the electric light of heaven seems to settle on the spot when your mammy says the blessing and the corn pawns hot when the cabbage pot is steaming and the bacon good and fat when the chitlins is a sputtin so to show you what they's at take away your soddy biscuit take away your cake and pie fur de glory time is comin and it's proaching mighty nigh and you want to jump and holla do you know you'd better not when your mammy is saying the blessing and the con pawns hot i have heyed o oh, lots of sermons i have heyed o oh, lots of prayers and i listened to some singin dat has tuck me upstairs of de glory land and set me jesus blow de master's throne and have left my heart a singin in a happy aftertone but dem words so sweetly murmured seems to tech de softest spot when my mammy says de blessin as de corn pots hot a death song lay me down beneath the willers in de grass what de branch shall go a singing as it pass and when it's a laying low i can hear it as it go singing sleep my honey tech your rest at last lay me nigh to wa hit meeks a little pool and de wa stands so quiet lack and cold wa de little birds in spring used to come and drink and sing and the chillin waited on de way to school let me settle when my shoulders drapes de load night enough to hear a de noises in de road for i think de last long rest one to soothe my spirit best if i's layin among the things i always knowed end of section three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section 4 of The Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Khalil B. The Book of American Negro Poetry. Edited by James Weldon Johnson. Section 4 james edwin campbell negro serenade oh the light bugs glimmer down the lane melindy melindy oh the whip-will callin notes your pain melindy oh melindy oh honey love my turkle dub don't you hear my banjo ringin while the night dew falls and the horn owl calls by the old barn gate i sing it Oh, Miss Lindy, don't you hear me, child? Melindy, Melindy, my love for you does drive me wild. Melindy, oh, Melindy, 
I'll sing this night till broad daylight. Bust my throat with trying. Lest you come down, Miss Lindy Brown, and stops his heart from sighing. The Conjure Man Oh, chill and run, the Conjure Man. Him mouth as big as frying pan. Him ears him small, him eyes him red. Him have no tooth in him old head. Him having roots, him working trick. Him roll him eye, him make you sick. The conjure man, the conjure man, oh, chill and run, the conjure man. Him have a ball of red, red hair, him hide it on the kitchen stair. Ma'am Jude, her paws along that way, and now her have a snake, they say. Him wrap around her body tight, her eyes pop out, a awful sight. The conjure man, the conjure man, oh, chill and run, the conjure man. Miss Jane, her driving from a doe, and now her hens won't lay no mo. The Jussie cow, her dumb fall sick, hit all dumb by the conjure trick. Him put a root in Lodge's bed, and now the man he show sure am dead. The conjure man, the conjure man, oh, chill and run, the conjure man. Me see him stand the other night, right in the road in white moonlight. Him tossing arms, him whirling round, him stomping foot upon the ground. The snakes come crawling one by one. Me hear him hiss, me break and run. The conjure man, the conjure man, oh, chill and run, the conjure man. Uncle F's banjo song. Clean the barn and sweep the flow, sing my banjo sing. We going to dance this evening show, ring my banjo ring. Then hits up the road and down the lane. Hurry, nigga, you missed the train. The yellow girl, she danced so neat. The yellow girl, she looks so sweet. Ring my banjo ring. The moon come up, the sun go down. Sing my banjo sing. The niggas am all come from town. Ring my banjo ring. Then hits round the hill and through the field. Look out there, nigga, don't you still. The millions on them vines and green. The moon and bright, oh, you'll be seen. Ring my banjo ring. Old Doc Hare A old hare live in a house on the hill. He hundred years old and never was ill. He ears they so long and eyes so big and his legs so spry that he dance a jig. He lives so long that he know everything's about the beasts that walks and the birds that sings. This old Doc Hare will live up there in a mighty fine house on a mighty high hill. He doctor for all the beasts and birds. He put on his specs and he use big words. He feel they pulse and then look mighty wise. He pull out his watch and he shut both eyes. He grab up his hat and grab up his cane. Then blam go the dough. And he gone like the train. This old dark hair will live up there in a mighty fine house on a mighty high hill. Mr. Bear falls sick. They sent for dark hair. Oh, doctor, come quick and see Mr. Bear. He might and not dead just shows you bone. Too much a young pig, too much a green corn. As he put on his hat, said old dark hair. I take long my lance and lance Mr. Bear, said old dark hair would live up there in a mighty fine house on a mighty high hill. Mr. Bear, he groaned. Mr. Bear, he growled, while the old Miss Bear and the children howled. Dr. Hare took out a sharp little lance. He pierced Mr. Bear till he made him prance, then grab up his hat and grab up his cane. Blam! Go the dough. And he gone like the train. This old Doc Hare would live up there in a mighty fine house on a mighty high hill. But the very next day, Mr. Bear, he dead. When they tell Doc Hare, he just scratch his head. If persons get well or persons get worse, money got to come in the old hair purse. Not what folks does, but for what they know, does the folks get paid? And Hare laughed low. This old Doc Hare would live up there in the mighty fine house on the mighty high hill. 
When Old Sis Judy Pray When Old Sis Judy Pray, the tears come stealing down my cheek. The voice of God would in me speak. I see myself so poor and weak. Down on my knees, the cross I seek. When Old Sis Judy Pray when old sis Judy pray, the thunders of Mount Sinai come rushing down from up on high. The devil turn his back and fly, while sinners loud for pardon cry. When old sis Judy pray, when old sis Judy pray, hard sinners tremble in their seat to hear her voice in sorrow peep, while all the church does sob and weep. Oh, shepherd, these thy poor lost sheep. When old sis Judy pray. When old sis Judy pray, the whole house hit they's rock and moan. To see her tears and hear her groan. There's something in sis Judy tone that melt all hearts dough made a stone. When old sis Judy pray. When old sis Judy pray, salvation's light comes pouring down. Hit fill the church and all the town. Why angels' robes go rustling round, and heaven on the earth am found. When old sis Judy pray, when old sis Judy pray, my soul go sweeping up on wings, and loud the church with glory rings, and wide the gates a jasper swings, till you hear hops with golden strings. When old sis Judy pray, Compensation O oh, rich young lord, thou ridest by with looks of high disdain. It chafes me not thy title high, thy blood of oldest strain. The lady riding at thy side is but in name thy promised bride. Ride on, young lord, ride on. Her father wills, and she obeys the custom of her class. Tis land, not love, the trothing sways, for land he sells his lass. Her fair white hand, young lord, is thine. Her soul, proud fool, her soul is mine. Ride on, young lord, ride on. No title high my father bore, the tenant of thy farm. He left me what I value more, clean heart, clear brain, and strong arm. And love for bird and beast and bee, and song of lark and hymn of sea. Ride on, young lord, ride on. The boundless sky to me belongs, the paltry acres thine. The painted beauty sings thy songs, the lavrock lilts me mine. The hot house orchid blooms for thee, the gorse and heather bloom for me. Ride on, young lord, ride on. End of section four. Recording by Khalil B. Section five of the Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Book of American Negro Poetry, edited by James Weldon Johnson. Section five. James D. Corothers At the Closed Gate of Justice To be a negro in a day like this demands forgiveness, bruised with blow on blow, betrayed like him whose woe-dimmed eyes gave bliss, still must one succor those who brought one low, to be a negro in a day like this. To be a negro in a day like this demands rare patience, patience that can wait, in utter darkness, tis the path to miss, and knock unheeded at an iron gate, to be a negro in a day like this. To be a negro in a day like this demands strange loyalty. We serve a flag which is to us white freedom's emphasis. Ah, one must love and truth and justice lag, to be a negro in a day like this. To be a negro in a day like this alas lord god what evil have we done still shines the gate all gold and amethyst but i pass by the glorious goal unwon merely a negro in a day like this
paul lawrence dunbar he came a youth singing in the dawn of a new freedom glowing o'er his lyre refining as with great apollo's fire his people's gift of song and thereupon this negro singer come to helicon constrained the masters listening to admire and rouse the race to wonder and aspire gazing which way their honest voice was gone with ebon face uplit of glory's crest men marvelled at the singer strong and sweet who brought the cabin's mirth the tuneful night but faced the morning beautiful with light to die while shadows yet fell towards the west and leave his laurels at his people's feet dunbar no poet wears your laurels now none rises singing from your race like you dark melodist immortal though the dew fell early on the bays upon your brow and tinged with pathos every halcyon vow and brave endeavour silence o'er you threw flowers of love or if an envious few of your own people brought no garlands how could malice smite him whom the gods had crowned if like the meadow-lark your flight was low your flooded lyrics half the hilltops drowned a wide world heard you and it loved you so it stilled its heart to list the strains you sang and o'er your happy songs its plaudits rang the negro singer o'er all my song the image of a face lieth like shadow on the wild sweet flowers the dream the ecstasy that prompts my powers the golden lyre's delight brings little grace to bless the singer of a lowly race long hath this mocked me i in marvellous hours when hera's gardens gleamed or cynthia's bowers or hope's red pylons in their far hushed place but i shall dig me deeper to the gold fetch water dripping over desert miles from clear nianzas and mysterious niles of love and sing nor one kind act withhold so shall men know me and remember long nor my dark face dishonour any song the road to the bow ever and ever anon after the black storm the eternal beauteous bow brother to rose painting mists that arch beyond blithely i go my brows men laurelled and my lyre twined with immortal ivy for one little rippling song my house of golden leaves they praised and passionate fire but friend the way is long onward and onward up away though fear flaunt all his banners in my face and my feet stumble lo the orphean day forward by god's grace these signs are still before me fear danger unprecedented and i hear black no still thundering and churl good friend i rest me here then to the glittering bow loometh and cometh hate in wrath mailed wrong swart servitude and shame with bitter rue nathless a negro poet's feet must tread the path the winged god knew thus my true brother dreamlet i forfend the anathema following the span i hold my head as proudly high as any man in the matter of two men one does such work as one will not and well each knows the right though the white storm howls or the sun is hot the black must serve the white and it's oh for the white man's softening flesh while the black man's muscles grow while i know which grows the mightier i know full well i know the white man seeks the soft fat place and he moves and works by rule ingenious grows the humbler race in oppression's prodding school and it's oh for a white man gone to seed while the negro struggles so and i know which race develops most i know yes well i know the white man rides in a palace car and the negro rides jim crow to damn the other with bolt and bar one creepeth so low so low and it's oh for a master's nose in the mire while the humbled hearts o'erflow well i know whose soul grows big at this and whose grows small i know the white man leases out his land and the negro tills the same 
one works one loafs and takes command but i know who wins the game and it's oh for the white man's shrinking soil as the black rich acres grow well i know how the signs point out at last i know ah well i know the white man votes for his colour's sake while the black for his is barred though ignorance is the charge they make but the black man studies hard and it's oh for the white man's sad neglect for the power of his light let go so i know which man must win at last i know ah friend i know an indignation dinner there was hard times just for christmas round our neighbourhood one year so we held a secret meeting where the white folks couldn't hear discuss the situation and to see what could be done toward a first-class christmas dinner and a little christmas fun rufus green who called the meeting rose and said in this ere town and throughout the land the white folks is a-trying to keep us down see they's bought us sold us beat us now they booze us cause we's free but when they touch my stomach they's done gone too fur for me is i right you show us rufus roared a dozen hungry throats if you'd keep a mule a-walkin don't you tamper with his oats that's sense continued rufus but these white folks nowadays as don got so close and stingy you can't live on what they pays here tis christmas time and folks is eyes indignant enough to choke was a christmas dinner comin when we's most completely broke i can't hardly fold a toothpick and a glass of water mad say i'm desperate they just better treat me nice these white folks had well they abused the white folks scandalous till old pappy simmons riz leanin on his cane to spotin on account his rheumatiz and see chillin what's that wintry wind a sighing do the street but you wasted summer wages but no matter we must eat now i see a beautiful turkey on a certain gemmon's farm He's a growin fat and sassy and a struttin to a charm. Chicken, sheep, hogs, sweet potatoes, all the crafts is fine this year. All we needs is a committee for to tote the goodies here. Well, we lit right in and voted that it was a grand idee. And the dinner we had Christmas was worth travelling miles to see. And we eat a full and plenty, big and little, great and small. Not because we was dishonest, but indignant, sir, that's all dream and the song so oft our hearts beloved lute in blossomy haunts of song are mute so long we pour mid murmurings dull our loveliness unutterable so vain is all our passion strong the dream is lovelier than the song the rose thought touched by words doth turn wan ashes still from memory's urn the lingering blossoms tenderly refute our wilding minstrelsy alas we work but beauty's wrong the dream is lovelier than the song yearn shelley or the golden flame left keats for beauty's lure a name but writ in water woe is me to grieve our flowerful fairy my phasian doves are flown so long the dream is lovelier than the song ah though we build a bower of dawn the golden-winged bird is gone and morn may gild through shimmering leaves only the swallow twittering eaves what art may house or gold prolong a dream far lovelier than a song the lilting witchery the unrest of winged dreams is in our breast but ever dear fulfilment's eyes gaze otherward the long-sought prize my lute must to the gods belong the dream is lovelier than the song end of section five